Good morning. The grace and peace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with each of you this morning. Thank you. I'm so glad that you're here today. Good to see all of you. I want to welcome you. If you're a guest visiting today, I know we have several guests. We got Bible school guests that are with us today. My name's Jay Smith, and I'm pleased to welcome you on behalf of this church. Uh, you're in a great place. This church has been here for almost 200 years trying to do the work of God in this community. And you've made a good choice to come and be with us today. And I'm glad you're here. We don't take it lightly. You could be a lot of places, but you've come to be with us today. We're so thankful. We've had a great week of Vacation Bible School. If you're not normally here, we don't normally have animals, but I kind of like the animals. I think it looks nice. And we're going to be celebrating. The kids are singing. It's just a great, great time in our church today. So we welcome all of you. If you are a guest, a couple of things. There are Get Connected cards on the pews all around you. Just fill that card out, and we would love to reconnect with you about the ministries of our church. Also, there's a gift that we'd love to give you after the service. If you'll go to these doors to my left, your right, if you're a guest, we'd love to give you a gift that also has some information related to the ministries of our church. So we're pleased that you've come our way today. If you look in the bulletin and you're a guest, you think, Amazing Grace, is that the only song they know? That's all they're singing today. We're concluding a series on the great hymn, Songs of Faith, Sustaining Faith. And today our focus is on Amazing Grace. And so that's why you see it throughout the service. Lee Young has other announcements. I'm so glad you've come to worship. We just have a couple of items we would like to lift up this morning. The first one is that you will notice you have a yellow insert in your bulletin again this week. This will be the last day that this is in there, but that is for a, a faith formation survey that we are asking everyone to fill out so that we can better assist you in ways that you would like to grow your spiritual walk with Christ. You can, it's mainly for Wednesday night gathering, but it could lead to many, many other ways that we can reach out to you and other people in our community. So we encourage you to fill that out. Give us the information that we can help you the best with. Also this Friday night, the youth are having a barn blast out at Jamie's house slash farm. So if your child, um, going sixth grade through 12th grade, I believe, right? Yes, sixth grade through 12th grade, just contact Jamie if you're going to be there so she can make sure she has all the supplies she needs and enough transportation to get there. But we encourage all of our children to do that. It's a wonderful time of just lots of fun and fellowship together before the school year starts. And then we have no other announcements this morning, so I invite you to go to the Lord in silent prayer as we prepare our hearts for worship this morning.
I invite you to join in our call to worship this morning from Psalm 86. It is printed in your bulletin. I invite you to stand now for our call to worship. <clears throat> Hear me, O God, and answer me, for I am poor and needy. Have mercy on me, Lord, for I call to you all day long. Bring joy to your servant, Lord, for I put my trust in you. You, Lord, are forgiving and good, abounding in love to all who call to you. And as we remain standing, I invite you to join in singing our opening hymn, number 378, Amazing Grace. standing let's join our voices together in this historic affirmation of the Christian faith the Apostles Creed printed in your bulletin join with me I believe in God the Father Almighty maker of heaven and earth and in Jesus Christ his only Son our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Spirit born of the Virgin Mary suffered under Pontius Pilate was crucified dead and buried the third day he rose from the dead he ascended into heaven and sitteth the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From then she shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, 
the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The first reading today is from Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3 to 7. If you'd like to follow along, it's in your Pew Bible, page 1156, large print, page 1817. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight, in love. He predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will, to, pra to, praise to, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace. This is the word of God for the people of God. As we prepare our hearts for prayer this morning, I invite you to join in singing the last verse of number 338, Where He Leads Me. Let's pray. Almighty and powerful God, we've come to celebrate you and your grace this morning. We pray that you will accept the gift of our worship, our words, our songs, and our actions that are offered this morning in praise and thanksgiving of you, because you have done marvelous things. We thank you for the amazing gift of Vacation Bible School this week for all the children and for the volunteers who made it possible for the blessing of the spirit that filled this place each and every night. Help us to come to you with that childlike enthusiasm and faith. We wish that we could face each day with carefree expectation, but the fact is that we are often weighed down with life's concerns. We each carry burdens needlessly forgetting that you have offered and are waiting to take them from us. So we ask now, Lord, that you please take our sorrows and our pain, walk with us through times of grief and loss, and free us to live in joy as forgiven people, covered with your grace in every moment of every day. Lord, we ask especially today for relief and recovery for those across our nation who are suffering from flood damage and fires threatening their homes. We pray you'll be with those who are seeking to repair and to stop the damage that's occurring. Show your power there in a mighty way. We ask all of these things in the matchless name of your son Jesus, our Lord and our Savior. And we pray together the prayer that he taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, 
who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We have the privilege of being God's partners in the work that God is doing in this world. And one of the ways that we do that is through the giving of our tithes and our offerings. So I ask our ushers to come forward to receive those from God's joyful givers this morning. Please pray with me. Our Father in heaven, we want to follow you fully. Help us to overcome our fears about giving with an expectant faith in your ability to provide. Help us to live more for eternity than life here on earth.
All right, it's a time we've been waiting for. Children, come on down. If you were at Bible school this week and you're going to sing with us this morning, come on down. We're going to fill up the steps right here. I need my readers to come stand over here next to me. As they're coming, I just want to tell you how proud I am of these kids. I want to, to tell you a couple of things in particular. This week, they, you would see flags hanging outside the office, and they had ways that they saw God at work this week, and they're hanging outside the office. I hope you'll take a minute to look at those before you leave today. I also want to tell you that all week long, they brought in money to help support the earthquake relief in Nepal, because our theme was Everest, Conquering Challenges with God's Mighty Power, and Everest is located in Nepal, so we decided it was a great idea to do our mission project to help earthquake relief in that country. So they brought in $200 this week, and we had a donor who matched that, so we are going to be able to give $400 to support earthquake relief in Nepal. Isn't that fantastic? And last but not least, before I turn the microphone over to these guys who are going to tell you what we learned every day, I would love for our volunteers who helped, if you helped with Vacation Bible School in any way this week, would you please stand right where you are and let us thank you for your time and your service. We had almost as many adults helping as we had children coming to Bible school, and that was such a blessing for me. So we saw God working in lots of ways. Here's some of the ways that we learned about God this week. On Monday, we learned that the ravens feeding Elijah, and that taught us that God has the power to provide. On Tuesday, we learned about God speaking to Elijah in a gentle whisper after a windstorm and earthquake and a, fa a fire that taught us that God has the power to comfort. On Wednesday, we learned that God healing Naaman went from his leprosy and that taught us that God has the power to heal. On Thursday, we learned from the apostle uh, the Peter that Jesus died on the cross and came back to life. We know that God has the power to forgive. On Friday, we learned that about heaven and we know that God has the power to love us forever. Jesus as my Savior, you take him too. I took 
accepted Jesus as my Savior, you take him too. I took Jesus as my Savior, you take him too. Way beyond the moon. Oh, Lord, oh, do Lord, oh, do.
For those of you who might be guests, we have Children's Church right at this time, so any of these kids who want to are invited to come upstairs and we'll have some time to celebrate Children's Church together and they can be picked up upstairs on the top floor. So if you guys want to come to Children's Church with me, let's head that way. If not, you're welcome to go back and sit with your parents. As the kids make their way to Children's Church, Cindy, stop right there. The only person she didn't mention, which she wasn't going to mention, is herself. Cindy was the mastermind, the chief coordinator, the planner, everything for Vacation Bible School. A really, really um, unbelievable week. Great, great job by everyone. Uh, we've got a lot of kids here today, and parents, if your kids came back to you in the pews, I want you to understand, you just take a deep breath. It's fine. If your kids are with you out there, there's absolutely nothing that they could do or say or any noise that they could make that would in any way distract me or disturb me. I can take you to churches that don't have to worry about the sound of children in them. And it breaks your heart. So the sound of kids is always a good sound. And so you be at ease if your kids are with you there and you're like, oh, please, dear Lord, this, it's all right. It's fine. Um, my sister, Jana, and her husband, Larry, came in a little late and they're here with us today. Her grandchildren, two of them, were in our Bible school this week. And Jana's right here and her husband, Larry, raised your hand. I have two sisters. And so Jana's the, the kind one that I mention occasionally in the sermons. <laughs> The mean, bad one, that's, that's Joy. That's our other, our other sister. So just wanted y'all to have that clear distinction. She's, she's the good one, of course. Today we are, are concluding a series of sermons on songs that sustain the faith. And you have a bulletin insert. Today we're looking at the greatest hymn, perhaps of all, of Amazing Grace. And you have an insert with the words of that hymn on it. And there's a place on the back of that insert for sermon notes. You may want to jot down a word or a phrase. My prayer would be that during this time, maybe there's a word or a phrase that God would give you that you'll carry into the week that would be a source of encouragement and hope for you. And so just use that as the Spirit would lead you today. But have that handy. I'm going to need your help singing uh, throughout the sermon. So please keep those words handy. The scripture text for... This great hymn, Amazing Grace, is Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 to 10. Ephesians 2, verses 8 to 10. For those of you who are able, would you please stand and honor the reading of God's holy word. Except for the words of Jesus that are recorded in the Gospels, these two verses here just could be the most significant words in the New Testament. Listen now for the word of the Lord. Paul writes, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus, to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. This is the word of God for the people of God. And thanks be to God. John Newton was born in London in 1725. His father was a shipping merchant and his father was Catholic. His mother had Protestant sympathies. She was an independent, affiliated not with the Anglican church. She was a bit of a renegade. And she was the one, his mother was the one that taught him the Bible. She was the one that taught him to pray early in his life. Can I get an amen for godly mothers and women that influence us in our lives? Such was the case with John Newton. But John Newton came upon adversity early in his young life. When he was six years old, his mother tragically died of tuberculosis. 
And for the next few years, he would be raised by, frankly, an emotionally distant stepmother. And his father, who was a merchant at sea, was gone quite a bit at sea. And he spent time in a boarding school. And we know that in that experience, he was mistreated often in that boarding school. And at the age of 11, at the age of 11, he joined his father on a ship as an apprentice to study with his father. And his sea-going career began at the age of 11. But John Newton was always headstrong, and he was very disobedient. He was uh, an original bad boy. And as a youth, there was a pattern that had developed by the time he was a young, a young youth. And, and he, the pattern was this, that he came near death many times as a youth, came close to death, and he would examine his relationship with God each time, but then he would relapse into bad habits once again. These bad habits followed him as a young sailor. And as a young sailor, he renounced his faith completely. And his disobedience caused him problems time and time again. In fact, his disobedience and breaking of the law allowed him, not allowed him, he was not drafted into the Royal Navy. He was pressed into service as part of his punishment to be in the Royal Navy where he continued to cause problems. He eventually would desert the Royal Navy and visit a woman that he had fallen in love with. Her name was Polly Catlett. After they captured him from deserting to go and be with Polly, they, sat, they decided that he would not be in the Royal Navy, but they traded him to a slave ship. And he began a career in slave trading. Newton often was openly mocking of the captain. He was very creative. And before he started writing great hymns like Amazing Grace, he had other things he would write. He would write obscene poems and songs about the captain and the crew members would join in in singing, not particularly pleasing to the captain. Disagreements and battles, he was often in fights with other sailors and in fact he resulted, the fights that he got into resulted in him, they intentionally tried to starve him to death. And they imprisoned him at sea. They were transporting slaves and they made him a slave just like the, the slaves that they were carrying. In fact, they took him to Sierra Leone and he was forced to work on a plantation. They wanted him off the ship, away from everyone. And he was forced to work as a slave himself in Sierra Leone. He came to understand that Sierra Leone was a home for some months, but then his father his father intervened. And when his father intervened, there was a ship by the name of Greyhound, and the Greyhound ship, by sheer coincidence, found him and rescued him, if you will. And while aboard the ship Greyhound, John Newton, he gained further notoriety for being one of the most profane men the captain had ever met. Keep in mind, uh, sailors were used to, and I'm sure it's different now, but sailors back then were used to persons using vulgar language, oaths and swearing, and he was admonished several times by the captain for not only using the worst words that were ever heard by this particular captain, but this is the way the captain described the language of John Newton. He was creating new words to exceed the limits of verbal debauchery. He was a bad, bad man vile in every way and he didn't care now a turning point by we would say the grace of god a turning point in march of 1748 while he was on the greyhound ship they were in the north atlantic and a violent storm came upon the ship and it was so rough that john newton was on 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 the ships on the on the up on deck of the ship and and the captain ordered him to do something, and he stepped aside, and someone stepped right where he had been, and the waves took that other sailor into the seas, and it shook him. And we're told that he got on his knees on board of that ship during the storm, and at one point he said, if this will not do, then Lord have mercy on us, and he wrestled with what to do. And he and others tried to save the ship, and he worked. He tied himself to the ship's pump so that he would not be washed over sea. And he spent 11 hours 
steering the ship through that storm. And it was during those 11 hours that he wrestled with God and the divine challenge came to him and the direction of his own life would change. That ship finally after two weeks would limp into a port in Ireland. The crew almost starved. The ship almost battered to pieces. It's interesting that John Newton's conversion, even after all of that, was not immediate. He surrendered his profanity to God. He gave that to God, but not much else. He still had the habits outside of the vulgar language that he was so known for. He even continued in the slave trade during these months. And he even became the captain of a slave ship. In Africa, he would go and capture the slaves and would transport them to North America. And not long after this, he married. He married that woman that he deserted the Royal Navy for. He married Polly. And he was promised at this time a ship, a captain of a ship, but cargo would not include slaves. And he was excited about this, but it didn't come through. He wasn't able to be the captain of this ship. And at the age of 30, he collapsed in exhaustion. And he never sailed again. They landed in Liverpool. And in 1756, working as a customs agent, John Newton began to teach himself Latin and Greek and theology. He and his wife, they immersed themselves in the church community. They were learning what it meant to be a disciple of Jesus. And his passion for this, his enthusiasm for this, was so impressive to other friends that they suggested and they encouraged him to become a priest. You need to be a priest in the Church of England. Initially, he was turned down. No big shock. His reputation preceded him. And the Bishop of York turned him down to ordain him as a priest. The stated reason was he had no university degree. Therefore, he could not be ordained. Although it's told, it's written of that although the more likely reasons were this, his leanings toward evangelism, the man cared about people that nobody else cared for. And he had a reputation of reaching out to anybody. And the other knock against him was this, and this is one we can all relate to. One of the reasons he was not ordained, he had a tendency to socialize with Methodists. That'll get you in trouble every time. Then and now. John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist movement, he knew John Newton, and John Wesley was taken with his passion and his enthusiasm. And John Wesley himself encouraged John Newton, you stay with it, you can become a priest in the Church of England. And in 1764, his dream of becoming a priest, his mother's dream of him becoming a, a clergy, he was ordained as a priest and he began serving in a small village only 2,500 residents, most of them were illiterate. And extremely poor. He served in a place that really nobody wanted to be sent. His stated mission he was a fiery preacher and he preached different than the other priests in the Church of England because he would tell personal stories and that was unheard of in pulpits in England at the time. And he would share about his own faith journey and what Christ had done for him and was doing for him. And his stated mission for his preaching was this, I love this, break a hard heart and to heal a broken heart. My mission is to break a hard heart and to heal a broken heart. It was during this time in Olney that he struck up a friendship with a man in the community by the name of William Copper. And William Copper was a gifted writer. He had failed in a career in law. Those of you that are a lawyer, y'all might be able to relate to that. It's hard to become a lawyer. And he had failed at trying to become a lawyer. And he was a writer. And he wrote poems. And he wrote songs. And he and John Newton became close friends. And they began writing poems and songs together. In fact, every week there was a prayer meeting. And during those prayer meetings, their goal was to have every week a new song, a new poem that they would share in those prayer meetings. And in January, New Year's Day, 
New Year's Day 1773, he brought out a new poem, a new song that he had written. And the original title of this new song was Face, Review, and Expectation. That just grabs you, doesn't it? Face, Review, and Expectation was the original title. But the first line of that poem was this. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. It was a song. It was a song written by a former slave trader, someone who had trafficked thousands of men and women and children from Africa, selling them at auction blocks in North America. It was a song that would be recorded 7,000 times and estimated performance of 10 million times a year, even to this date. It's a song with a few notes, but those few notes lift the heads of the hopeless. It softens the hearts of the hardened. Amazing Grace, you know this, Amazing Grace was sung by both sides during the Civil War. Amazing Grace, it was used as a requiem by the Cherokee Indians as they made their trail of tears all the way through Hopkinsville, Kentucky, all the way out to Oklahoma, the trail of tears, and the Cherokee Indians sang Amazing Grace. Civil rights protesters sang it defiantly during the freedom marches, and on that sweltering August day in 1963 when Dr. King shared his dream, they sang at that holy monument, Amazing Grace. Amazing Grace rang out the day when Nelson Mandela, who had been imprisoned in South Africa for 27 years in prison, and the day he was released, they sang Amazing Grace. Amazing Grace was sung when the Berlin Wall came down. And on September 11, 20, 2001, Amazing Grace was sung in churches around the world to comfort, to comfort those who mourn. Amazing Grace, after Hurricane Katrina, the New Orleans Saints, the football team, New Orleans, to go into the Superdome, a professional football team, their entrance into the Superdome, and as they came into the Superdome, they sang Amazing Grace. And it revived the spirit of a fallen city. And most recently, I was watching the funeral, and some of you watched the funeral as well, and please, this is not a political thing for me at all, but I was as amazed as anyone, but at the funeral of, of Reverend Clem Pinckney, who was one of the nine killed at the Emanuel AME Church on June 17th, and the President of the United States giving his eulogy, he closed out the eulogy, if you saw it, it was unbelievable, the first time they believe a sitting president ever sang, and he sang Amazing Grace, and that congregation rose up. It was, I mean, it's the only thing, really, it's the only thing that would have been appropriate. Amazing Grace. Vacation Bible School this week. Kids, or any of the kids, most of them went upstairs. Parents, where are you, parents? Are you tired of the songs? Do you know you have to hold on, right? The kids, I don't know which animal taught them which lesson. I, I got lost with the animals, but they were taught about the power of God this week. And the power of God, God has the power to do certain things. And they were taught each night a different thing. God has the power to comfort. Hold on. Hold on. God has the power to provide. Hold on. God has the power to heal. Hold on. God has the power to forgive. Hold on, and God has the power to love us forever. 
Hold on. And we didn't say it to the kids, but I'm saying it to you now. And parents, you can reiterate that. All those qualities of God, all the qualities of God's power, they can be summed up in one phrase. They represent one thing, the amazing grace of God. That captures it. All of those things are the grace of God. It is the grace of God that has the power to transform. It is the grace of God that can change right, wrong from into right. It is the power of God's amazing grace that can turn a slave trading captain of a slave ship into someone who would spend the rest of his life fighting for the end of slavery in Great Britain. And he and people like William Wilberforce and John Wesley, they would win that battle. They would end the scourge of slavery in Great Britain long before it would be removed here in this nation. Amazing grace. Friends, there is no such thing in the church. Now you won't hear this anywhere else. Everywhere else you go, People will talk about you and I. We can be self-made men. We can be self-made women. That is a lie. In the church, we don't believe that. In the church, we believe we are grace-made people. We are made and shaped by the grace of God. We are grace-made men and women. That's who we are. I've been a pastor for over 30 years, and I've spent my whole life in the church. And I have learned two things, at least two things about God's grace. And those are these and this isn't earth shattering. But I've learned two things. And the first thing about God's grace is everybody needs it. Everybody. I don't care where you're from. I don't care how much money you have. I don't care where you were educated or if you were educated. Everybody needs the grace of God. Everybody is broken. Everybody. Needs healing. And the second thing I've learned about God's grace is that for most of us, not everybody, maybe not you, but for most of us, God's grace is easier to extend to somebody else than to accept it for yourself. It's easier for most of us to be more gracious and kind to a complete stranger than to ourselves. Or to those in our family. The grace of God. We all need it. But it's so hard to accept. Because we're so proud. There's one thing that stands between God and any human being. And that is pride. It's arrogance. I love Paul Tillich. That great mind of the 20th century. That German theologian. I didn't understand most of what he wrote. But he wrote a book entitled The Shaking of the Foundation. And I love Tillich's definition. This is Tillich's definition of grace. Grace is accepting that you are accepted. Isn't that beautiful? God's grace is accepting that you are accepted. And once you can allow the acceptance of God's grace in your life, then your life can be healed and your life can be set on a course to do, as Paul referenced, we were, we're made for good works in this world. And that's what happens when we accept God's acceptance. That's grace. Or Eugene O'Neill, I love his short poem. Eugene O'Neill wrote this. He said, man is born broken. Every one of us. He lives by mending. The grace of God is glue. holds it together the grace of God is glue it's the grace of God that helps us put back our lives no matter how broken no matter how torn apart they may be the grace of God I got a message about three o'clock yesterday afternoon and I have her permission to share this. I got the message, I got the word. Some of you got the same message. Blythe Ann Hawkins Smith, her, her mother passed away. She was 90 years old. She celebrated her 90th birthday on Friday and yesterday afternoon she passed away. She was at Blythe Ann's home. She has been taking care of her mother and her father for several months now. And her mother, Betty Ann, had dementia. She had uh, perhaps Alzheimer's or stages, early stages of Alzheimer's. 
And I got the word and I went to see Blythe Ann. Her father was there. I knew he would be there. I call him Mr. Bostic. He quickly says, you call me Chuck. So I went and, and Chuck was sitting there. They, they had been married 68 years. He said, we've known each other since we were 10 years old. For 80 years, this woman has been a part of my life. The grace of God has been transmitted through this person into my life. 68 years. He said, uh, he said I, I used to call her Shorty. She's five foot. If y'all know Blythe Ann, that's where Blythe Ann gets her tall stature from her mother. He was speaking of Friday night. He said, last night, Friday night, he said, I fussed at her because she kept pulling the covers off of me. I couldn't get her to stop pulling off the covers. And he said, tonight, I'm going to really want He said, I don't know what I'm going to do. And I just listened. And then I told him this. I said, uh, I said, Chuck, you will get through this. Now, why would I say such a thing? How could I say such a thing? I can say it because I believe. I believe in God's amazing grace. And we could spend the rest of this day going around this sanctuary and you could stand and you could testify to a time in your life where you didn't see the other side, but in hindsight you can see how God got you through it. And so I could share with him. You, you will get through this because of God's amazing grace. I love, I love that great theologian. And I've shared with you before, it's my, fa my favorite show of all time. That great theologian and TV icon, Andy Griffith. Try this on. It's not bad for a country sheriff. Listen to this. Andy Griffith said, in every situation, no matter how difficult, God extends grace greater than the hardship and strength and peace of mind that can lead us to a place higher than where we were before. John Newton. He simply put it this way. Through many dangers, toils, and snares, I have already come. Tis grace hath brought me save thus far, and grace will lead me home. Let us pray. Holy and gracious God, we thank you and we praise you for who you are. We thank you for your power power that overcomes all darkness, the power that reveals true light in the world. Oh God, you know us. You know every one of us here today. You know what we came into this sanctuary carrying. Oh God, if there's something that we need to leave with you this day, may we leave it to and trust it to the care of your amazing grace. Oh God, each one of us in the sanctuary of our own hearts May we release those things that we carry that keep us 
down and keep us back. Help us, O oh God, to cling to you and to trust in your amazing grace. We thank you for it. We praise you for it. We thank you for the gift that this hymn continues to be to each of us. May your grace be the grace that we extend to others in this hurting world. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, who was your amazing grace made flesh. And he lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. And all God's grace made people did say, Amen. As you're able, let us stand together. Lee's going to come and lead us one more time. Amazing grace. Let us stand as you're able. to join with me in a famous quote of uh, John Newton. Actually, this is a paraphrase of something he once said. Now, ladies, you can substitute the word man for woman. I didn't have an opportunity to make that change. So you just insert uh, the, the word woman in this. Let this be our benediction today. Would you join with me? I am not the man I ought to be. I am not... 
I am not the man I hope to be, but by the grace of God, I am not the man I used to be. Go in peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.